I want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Um, Bonato and Dr. Plummer to speak with us tonight. Uh, about six weeks or so ago, they joined us and we um, were talking about preparing for school reentry and how to support students with practical social emotional skills and strategies. And now we're six weeks in. So um, it's time to check in and just have a discussion with you and um, our families around what's happening and kind of think about what is going on related to um, you know, the situation we're in and we're in a hybrid model where our students come two days a week and we have an A and a B cohort and then we're all remote on Wednesday. Um, so our kids are in school for two days a week and then three days a week it's remote. Some of our students with special needs are in for four days a week to receive their services. So um, I want to welcome Dr. Bonato and Dr. Plummer to speak with us. Um, I'll just give a quick overview for those of you who didn't join us six weeks ago, but Dr. Bonato is a board certified child and adolescent psychiatrist with several decades of experience. He maintains an office-based private practice in Providence, Rhode Island, and also serves as the medical director of the acute residential treatment program at St. Mary's Home for Children in Rhode Island. He completed his child and adolescent fellowship at Brown University Hospitals in 1994. And Dr. Plummer is a board certified licensed child psychologist with several decades of experience and an office-based practice. He holds a PhD in psychology from the University of Rhode Island and completed a fellowship in clinical psychology at Devereaux Foundation. Additionally, he was on the staff at McLean Hospital at Harvard University and administered an inpatient adolescent unit at Bradley Hospital. For the past 30 years, Dr. Plummer has been a faculty member at Albert Medical School of Brown University in the Department of Child Psychiatry, teaching and supervising clinical psychology fellows in child psychiatry and triple board fellows. And um, Dr. Bonato and Dr. Plummer have shared many years of providing consultation services to children, families, and school teams in public school settings, special education collaboratives, residential treatment facilities and day programs. And we're lucky to have them both here again. Um, and uh, so that was, uh, I, I think I got it all for introductions. Um, so tonight we have about an hour. So those of you who have joined us and we will take questions along the way. So if you have questions, just type them right into the Q and A at the bottom of your screen and we will respond and I'll keep that, um, I'll keep that box open so you don't have to worry about monitoring it Dr. Palmer and Dr. Bernardo I will do that and uh, yeah because it's a little hard to do both and um, we also have uh, Barbara Sawanka she's joining us she is our director of student services and special education so she is popping in so um, good evening everyone hi how are you thank you so much um, everybody for joining us tonight so um I'm going to open it up though and just ask about what are you seeing um, in your practices around children's behavior as they're entering into you know the hybrid model coming back into even even if they're just in a remote only what kind of things are you seeing in, in children um dr bernardo and i usually go back and forth before we do that i'm going to drop the several decades of experience from now on i'm not putting a number on that anymore <laughs> I note to myself, I at that and just kind of like, All right. you know, when you put on like the combined experience in like a law firm or something, <laughs> I, I don't want to reach the hundred mark. Um, yeah, I hear you. So I, what I'm seeing is a lot of masks. Um, mm -hmm. We talked earlier about just in, uh, in all seriousness, that's a such a pleasant surprise mm -hmm. to see kids of all levels of ability, you know, not just um, cognitive, but just to, the ability to tolerate a mask and uh, to do it so well, you know, build, building in the mask breaks and things that uh, educators are, are doing regularly, but um, being able to pretty much do their thing, including outside um, playing volleyball with masks on. I was at a, at a public day school the other day and but they were um, they were doing that, doing it well. I don't know, think I would have, but um, they were outside and uh, kind of obeying all the rules. And um, I think the in-person stuff of it is going particularly well. And I think the hybrid, um, the virtual at-home part is uh, sort of depends on the, on the student. And uh, with that having been said, overall, um, I'm kind of giving everybody an A minus on the report card um, 
for preparedness, um, you know, having the buses waiting in a parking lot coming in one at a time, six kids, five kids on a bus. Um, it's, it's like a military operation done with precision with, um, pretty good attitudes. I will say that, um, the downside of it is for kids who don't learn as well virtually that um, and would do better in person if they elected to, it's hard. There's always room to do it. Um, and then the second piece is, as a rule, as hard as teachers are trying, and I don't know if this is Dr. Bernardo's experience, mine is, is that um, they are really stressed trying to do it all. And that is keep their own kind of worries in check and those of their kids and um, do the virtual piece and the in-person piece, um, but they're doing it well. Dr. Bernardo, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you're still muted. Hey, Steve. Oh yeah, gotcha. Dr. Bernardo, I was just wondering, um, what, you and I haven't had a chance to talk about this piece of it. What are your thoughts on that? Well, just first I wanna clarify that Dr. Plummer has decades more experience than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I had an idea that that was going to happen. We were going to <laughs> that stuff around. All right. You can tell we know each other. And actually, <laughs> we share that same office in Providence. But oh. Dr. Bernardo's in it a little more than I am. A lot. Um, um, so, yeah, I, uh, I've been impressed overall with how, how well kids have adapted to the uh, hybrid model. I mean, I know many who are also doing full remote and other districts, but, uh, you know, and parents, I think it's been more of a strain on parents in some ways. Um, the kids who are able to do hybrid and be amongst some of their peers are definitely very happy that they are doing it, the ones I've talked to. Um, I think they're really excited to be around, you know, their peers. And uh, the one thing I've noticed is that kids who do have maybe marginal problems with paying attention uh, do seem to struggle more with the remote uh, method of learning, it seems, you know, because they've got to basically sit still uh, and they've got to be focused on the screen. And it's kind of harder, to, I think, for them to kind of grab, gather the information, um, you know, remotely. I've had a number of parents sort of point out how that seems to be more of a challenge for them. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been impressed with how well it's gone. And I, and I, you know, the school districts that I've uh, encountered are really, as Dr. Plumber was saying, have really given a lot of thought to how to logistically, you know, move people in safe ways and, uh, you know, have drug supply pickups. And, uh, you know, obviously I think they depend a lot on volunteers too, PTOs that have really stepped up and helped out a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, um, parents, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say parents have really yeah. prepared their children when they came through the door. I'm amazed and impressed at how well the students take direction. They understand the hours at a very young age. Our preschoolers, they know they step right on these spots. They line up. They try to keep their distance. It's really impressive. So parents have really worked hard with their, their children, too, to help them transition back into school. And that's no easy task. Um, you know, because everybody's struggling to figure out what's going to work for them. That's very true. Day one, I was in our pre-K classroom and they were all wearing their little masks on day one and they were doing a great job with it. They were. It is. I'm just, um, so I was in Plainville this morning um, doing a neuropsych eval and, um, and I was walking in and I was kind of amazed at how long it took to create all of the little boxes out in front of the school with spray paint. And I'm thinking somebody, the custodians worked extra hard to get all of the arrows and the boxes and the spots all lined up in the corridors outside the schools. Um, it's, it's, it's just an amazing adaptation. Um, I neglected to say at the beginning too, but Dr. Bonato did. It is, um, it's really hard on parents. Mm -hmm. I know, um, you know, I'm very upbeat and, and optimistic and pleased with how people have been able to pull this off and pitch in. Um, but parents, it's really hard. If you've got more, uh, even with one learner at home, but more more than one student at home doing that, it is and managing your own households and uh, and jobs. It's um, you know incredibly difficult. I will say that. And so we're finding out how to do it. 
I think that there may be questions from parents around some of the, uh, Steve, you mentioned this earlier, there, there are kids who, who are having a harder time with the virtual piece of it. And I think our lessons from this will be that um, we really need teachers. <laughs> we need them in person in the ideal world that, you know, the virtual piece will only be sort of a, um, a backup, if you will, and, um, and and maybe that we can get more refined about it. But it's difficult to do it as effectively as a teacher can teach your child in person. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely so that, true. Um, yeah. Obviously, we want to move to a place where we will all be healthy enough and the world will be healthy enough and we can all come into the, you know, into our buildings full time. Um, but maybe um, talking a little bit, you talked a little bit about some of the behaviors. Um, but what about kind of managing some of the pieces at that remote piece? Organization, excuse me, yeah. <laughs> the workload, maybe some tips. So those are the things I think the parents are figuring out and then what we're asked to comment on, um, both in Zoom meetings directly, one-on-one -on -one with parents that are um, that I'm clinically involved with and also um, consulting to their programs. So the combination is how do we make that work for kids with executive impairment? So just to throw that phrase out there, that would be um, inclusive of ADHD and other kinds of difficulties which create problems. Um, let's see, tolerating boredom, uh, filtering out distractions. Those would be the uh, devices that might be around you, noises, other kids learning next to you, near you. Um, the phone that is going off about three feet from me that I can't figure out how to turn off, but I'll continue with the conversation. Um, that those are the kind of things that um, it is harder to do on this sort of screen format. So giving kids breaks, preparing their area, if you will, um, which may sound as simple as like, why would you have to remind kids about devices? But kids are kids and they're using them a little more these days. So um there are there are steps that parents are doing to kind of create the the learning environment in terms of a quieter area um getting kids up and ready for that particular lesson and also preparing the surroundings to make it a little more conducive to learning um they're doing a whole lot more but those will be sort of the steps that are taken parents are having a backfill they're listening I think they're picking up when their kids aren't paying attention and they're trying to uh, cue them. Um, and that's probably, depending on the kid, going to take more than just preparation, but kind of coaching as you go, reminders, incentives, and helping out with movement breaks. Mm -hmm. I Dr. think we're finding too, which is in kind of an interesting balance, is that as much as we worry about, you know, those of us who kind of house ourselves in the special education field about all of those kids on 504s and IEPs and things like that. We're finding that all kids really need a lot of coaching and training around their executive functioning skills in this remote world. It's one thing to be able to use yeah. a device. It's another thing to be able to use it to kind of to learn. Mm -hmm. And another thing we're finding that we so appreciate parents being so supportive of their children. Um, but but sometimes when the teacher or the ESP, which is our paraprofessional, is on with the child, you know, parents should take the opportunity to kind of give themselves a little bit of a break. It's hard to be a parent and try to also teach your child. And, um, you know, you, you can kind of sometimes use those opportunities maybe as the teachers are getting, you know, into a little bit of rhythm with the kids to kind of give yourselves a little bit of a break to be able to be off for a little bit and leave it to the teacher and the child and then come back in, you know, certainly when you see things kind of going down or a, a little bit like that. But um, we all need balance in our lives in this world. We really do. And um, that, was, important that was well that. put because the flip side of that is also, we're very tactful about that. Uh, the flip side is, is that teachers are, they need to be able to have that experience um, with your child to be able to kind of figure out where they're at on their own. Um, so there, the balance is getting prepared and then stepping back a little bit and letting letting that evolve between what your son or daughter needs and, and can do and how the teacher responds to it on the screen. Um, 
but it is it is a reminder that this is um, very taxing for kids with good executive skills to do um, because it's sort of the eye strain and the way the information comes in is um, is very different. It's not like even a video game, where you, which is a whole lot of fun because of the, the multiple stimuli. Um, education is presented in a way that I think has reduced the modalities. It's visual, there's a little bit of sound, um, the voice and stuff, but the modalities have shrunk down, which makes the learning a little harder. Yeah, that's a good list of different things that uh, I think uh, you know folks need to manage in terms of this remote learning. Um, one of the things uh, that I think is also important is just a lot of computer hygiene practices. I don't know if your folks have gotten around to that, but you know, since you're having to make a, uh, a new connection to the internet every morning, obviously getting parents and kids in the habit of plugging in their devices so they're not dead mm -hmm. in the morning, actually turning them off at night so that when they start up in the morning, they kind of are you know, refreshed and able to make a better connection uh, to the internet so there's not Few, so there are fewer problems with that, um, you know, and I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a burden for kids, but I think it's, it's been more of a burden for parents, really, from how I see it, because, you know, the parents are sort of dealing with this sort of double trifecta problem, you know, they're still caregivers, they're still homemakers, uh, they're still partners, employees, and now they've got to be sort of educators, while at the same time trying to survive a pandemic. You know, um, it's a lot on parents' plates. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we just read a lot about it in the popular press. And it's, uh, you know, if, if, the, if there's one parent who has the luxury of being home and devoted full time to monitoring their kid's education, that's one thing. And that's, you know, definitely a luxury. But there's a lot of parents who are still trying to do their own work at home. Um, or maybe out of the home while they're leaving some of their older kids in the house trying to do uh, remote learning. And it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult, I think, for parents to be able to um, monitor and supervise just how much of the work's getting done. I don't know in, in uh, Cohasset how much feedback uh, parents are getting around their kids' work completion and participation, um, but I would think that, um, I would think that most of them would would invite more communication rather than less. I suspect, you know. Um, hey, Dr. Bernardo, you're also um, doing this as a parent as well. I am. So you have got the this is first parent experience. We've chatted a little bit about that, which is I'm not. My kids are are older at this point, uh, or old enough not to be in virtual learning. So, um, yeah, that's you're doing you're doing that trifecta. So it's, um, it's, it's a lot. So um, there, are, there are things that parents probably will figure out that their child needs as they go. But um, I think just in terms of being concrete about it, it is worth having a routine. And Dr. Bono, you spoke around this before. It starts the night before with bedtime is on a hybrid night bedtime five or six day, nights a week ideally should be the same for for all of us just the, the way our bodies work but the routine of preparing the technology for the morning um, the next morning and everything from snacks to where's it going to be how's it going to be set up and what's on what time are you on i i don't know what it's like in cohasset but there i listened to this i won't say the district but there are three different start times for this one. I think it's the high school group, depending on the day. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's just, maybe I didn't listen to it properly, but it's not the same time. There were two, I thought they said three, which would be maddening for me as a parent trying to figure out um, how to get that going because they aren't like 10 minutes apart. Some of them vary by, I think it was like 45 minutes, but preparation the night before, um, preparing the technology, getting the sleep piece done. And then we talked, I think, last time about this, Dr. Bernardo, the idea that it is worth having the conversation and checking in on who's up at night using devices because it can't, there are two reasons. One is the obvious fatigue, sleep hygiene, uh, not good for learning. The second is there's only so much of the backlighting in the devices 
that one can deal with um, in, in a, in a 24 hour period. And we're probably overloading it with the virtual part, no matter how many cool, you know, protective screens you put on it. It is, um, it is a stressful way to learn for your eyes. And so managing device time in general throughout the day and at night, it's not a popular topic because it's, it's a pretty good stress reliever as well. But, um, the preparation, the routine, and then the availability to problem solve with your child afterwards, which would be when the device gets to the laptop, Chromebook is off. It may also later on be a time to check in and say, sorry, what worked well about that? What else do you need? You need some help with this? Everything working well with the technology? Do you need more breaks? So some parent check in instead of like, how is it going? Just a little more specific around problem solving because sometimes it may mean stepping in um, with the teacher if the child is not doing that on their own or the teacher hasn't picked up on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think too, um, you know, with all that there is to manage uh, for parents, you know, I think it's uh, their time becomes even more uh, crimped and uh, sometimes it uh, doesn't leave enough time to sort of uh, connect to kids and to really kind of get at what their experience about it is, is like. Um, so, you know, I like to recommend that if there was ever a time to kind of start having like regular family meetings every week, uh, this would sort of be a good time to do it, to kind of see like, well, what's been working this week? What went well in terms of how we all did things? Um, what didn't? Uh, what do we need to do a little differently? And I think also given, um, you know, uh, all the one people have to deal with. I think a couple of things would be for folks to kind of get together and each member of the family come up with something they could be grateful for, for the week in terms of how it went. Um, and also celebrate some aspect of success that occurred during the week in terms of how everybody kind of did all the things that they have to do. I think it's really good to sort of emphasize those positive uh, experiences and maybe how challenges became, uh, um, you know, overcome. Mm -hmm. And to really applaud kids for their efforts around that. Um, yeah, so I think that's a good thing to focus on. And then I think also, you know, uh, as everyone knows, sometimes bedtimes are kind of difficult for kids. And uh, um, obviously with bedtimes, you don't want to use bedtime as an opportunity to explore what their worries are necessarily and uh, things that might you know, their, their fears of the worst case scenario. Um, you want to use save that for some time in the afternoon or some other time in the earlier in the evening, or maybe even the morning, if you have the time to process it with them and instead use bedtime to kind of focus on, you know, something they're looking forward to some happy memory, uh, something that the family's looking forward to, you know, later in the week. And I, and I would say also around those same lines, uh, the more you can add in weekly family rituals of some sort, you know, I'm sure many folks have them already, but you know, boy, one night a week could be pizza night or it's a movie night or, you know, the more of those sorts of regular enjoyable routines that you can kind of build into the structure and functioning of the family. I think that helps kids feel more grounded and supported and gives you some positive place to anchor the week with them as you, you know, slog through it. It, uh, it can be a slog. I think that for some families, the, um, you know, in my world, we, this sort of the cross section is literally um, it's the same thing with Dr. Bernardo. We, we get to talk with families for whom, um, you know, there are significant pressures for things that uh, other families just may take for granted. And that will include, um, you know, where you're going to be living next month, um, how much food there is, when the money runs out. Um, unemployment, a variety of different things. And so, um, and even in the, in the most resourced of communities, there are still those of need. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a tough thing to juggle. It's also not something we speak of openly, but um, even in these times, there are, there are more families in this pandemic that are struggling with this than before. And, and it does cut across communities. Mm -hmm. I, the other thing that comes to mind is, and this will be harder to do in three months, but right now it's still um, outdoor time and getting kids out of the house of all ages 
and working with them creatively on how to do that in a safe way. Um, that can be the neighborhood I live in, um, which when you're walking or driving up the street, you get to see. So kids are coming over and playing basketball or they're sitting outside and talking or a variety of other things that kids have found a way to connect around. Now, I don't go up with the tape measure to see if they're, you know, six feet apart, the, you know, the one or two meter rule. But um, I think there are ways to do that safely outdoors. Um, and it does matter a lot, I think, around the social connectivity piece. So I do think the kids are getting a taste of that with both in person, um, but the hybrid part of it and the on off part still Know, leaves a lot to be desired around in-person social activities and things that we just haven't been able to make up for. Some sports have come back online, but they're few. Um, so the social piece of it is requires a lot of creativity and problem solving around how to do it and how to do it with a cohort or people that you know you have connections with that you know are might be safer than say a party with lots of different kids coming to uh, together. So. Those are the uh, the social piece of it. And then the other thought, and parents may have questions about this, um, it's the on-off part is hard to do for some kids. Okay. So it's something to go all virtual and have that routine. It's another thing to experience like going to school in person and realizing, yeah, I kind of like this, or it's more kids are looking forward to that than maybe would have a year ago because um, it's a novelty now. And then switching off or switching modalities and going all virtual for, you know, that hybrid day. Um, the on off part of it is is a, it's something to manage for kids, and it's it's a very different experience. Um, so some kids are doing better at it than others. And I will say um, that you will be fortunate as a community if Cohasset does not have increased failure rates for the hybrid days. There are a couple communities I'm consulting with where those rates have notched up because it is so much harder to do at the same level of productivity. So okay. I'm speaking frankly on that. That's obviously out of my wheelhouse with you guys, but we're in a pandemic. Right. Um, there's pressure all around for kids, especially juniors and seniors, to not have that letdown in grades or you know, academic excellence, the ones that really want to go on. The pressure piece of it in trying to do the, you know, the on-off modality, that's just something to keep tabs on as we go forward for our guidance counselors and parents. There's no answer around that, but um, it's not business as usual either. Right. And we do notice, <laughs> you know, those kids that are, um, you know, we've, we've heard parents reflect that their children are so excited when it's hybrid day and they are ready to go and at the door um, and they become a totally different child on remote day. They're unhappy. They're hard to motivate. Um, they are fussy. Um, they're aggravated. So um, that's a, you know, if you, if you have any tips, I'm sure parents would, would welcome that because it's, you know, you just spoke about it. Um, and we've had parents talk about that struggle. Yeah. That's, a, that's a hard one to flip. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, it is. I can understand why that would be their experience, actually. Um, uh, you know, I think you uh, probably parents need to put even more effort into arranging some kind of opportunity for safe, uh, you know, play dates or hangout sessions or whatever you would call them, depending on the age range, um, you know, on the weekend so that you, they have that to look forward to, that kind of social interaction to look forward to. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think you know, there's just there's no there's no substitute for in person uh, with teachers and peers, no no doubt. Um, it's acknowledging, Dr. Bernardo. It's acknowledging as well, without kind of capitulating and just saying, all right, let's take a little remote vacation day, you know, instead of, uh, but acknowledging that it is harder. Um, so I'll share with direct experience. Uh, you know, it's both the a blessing and a curse in nowadays to have a practice where you have the flexibility to be able to do Zoom meetings. But there are some days um, where I have Zoom meetings six, seven, maybe eight hours, and there's no in-person stuff at all. Um, the in-person, you know, that's my lifeblood. That's what we, you know, we're trained to do. It's very different. It's hard to assess kids or 
teach or do anything on the Zoom end of it the same way. So when you go through the experience, and then the next day I might be in person for half or two thirds of the day doing a variety of different things, um, it's on off for me. And that experience isn't pleasant. Um, I mean, I can, you know, rally, I'm a big boy, you get up and you kind of get through. But um, Steve, you said it, if there's a way to somehow do something that A, acknowledges it, but also creates um, more of a break, something that compensates for that on those remote days, because they're, for most kids, they're harder. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, one of the, I was just going to say, one of the things that I uh, worry a lot about, particularly as we approach uh, what's called the third wave across the country is, uh, you know, people just becoming tired of this uh, 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 with pandemic fatigue, essentially, you know, that everybody's, everybody's tired. And, um, you know, unfortunately, as I say to people, it's human nature to think that, well, okay, I've survived the last eight months. I guess it's not really such a big deal. I, you know, it's not really as dangerous as everybody makes it seem because I haven't been affected, you know, personally, or maybe no one you know has been affected, per, you know. Uh, so you kind of start to relax your vigilance a little bit and you start to relax some of those uh, protective and containment measures that, you know, are recommended uh, at varying levels, with varying levels of conviction um, by various <laughs> You know, to kind of contain the virus. So, you know, wearing a mask and washing your hands. If you can't wash because there's no sink, you know, sanitize, uh, stay six feet away and uh, avoid crowds, people, you know. And then if you get sick, you feel sick, get tested. Yeah. You know, um, it's kind of those six basic rules of, uh, of really surviving the pandemic and it's how we protect ourselves and how we protect other people. And I think uh, it's really important for everybody to wake up every day and sort of pretend it's back like in March or April when, you know, everybody was terrified that walking out of their house was gonna put them in an ICU. Um, and, uh, or at least some people were thinking that. Um, mm -hmm. And the problem with this virus is that still, we don't have any way of predicting who will suffer severe illness from it, um, you know, there are young athletes uh, who who succumb to this virus. Um, you know, we all know that elderly folks are more prone, and uh, you know, the survival rate of people above 80 is, you know, not very good. Uh, but there's a whole lot of people in between uh, who most are unscathed, most don't even have symptoms, but those who do and get very sick get really sick, and we know it's much more. Uh, the mortality rate is much higher than your genuine, gen, you know, uh, general influenza. You know, and so, lines, yeah. I would just give the usual, you know, doctor sermon around uh, the importance of everyone being vaccinated. Um, you know, I know there's still lots of folks who are not really in favor of vaccines per se, and sometimes people have the experience of getting a vaccine and then feeling a little sick and thinking like, oh my God, the vaccine actually gave me the flu or, or whatever. So I'm not going to do that again. And it's really important to actually ref sort of understand that for what it really is, which it was, you felt a little sick, which was your body's way of telling you, yes, we're doing a great job inside here of launching an immune re as response to this, to this uh, vaccine and uh, the real virus. Um, and once you get the real flu, you realize that what you experienced with that vaccine was really not a big deal. Uh, cause when you have the real flu, you know it. Um, so, uh, you know, just encourage people to get those vaccines. Um, I think it's also really important too, because you know, the, the, uh, symptoms of COVID are not all that specific. You know, there's loss of taste or smell that's new. That's pretty much about the only one that's specific. All the rest are common with the flu, common cold, you know, runny nose, congestion, uh, sore throat, headache, fatigue, uh, nausea or vomiting. Uh, so if you've had the vaccine for the flu, that diminishes the risk or the likelihood, doesn't rule it out, but it diminishes the likelihood that those symptoms are due to the flu um, and therefore raises the index of suspicion that, well, okay, well, I guess we just better go get that test for COVID and uh, rule that out, so. Dr. Bernardo, you've got um, 
So a nice way of reminding parents that, especially in the winter months, especially as this routine gets old, there's a medical piece to this, and then there's a behavioral piece. And the behavioral piece, particularly if you have teenagers who um, are sort of built in to challenge things and, you know, and also act in the moment, um, is a reminder about the routines and a reminder about the things that, may, that will keep us safe. Um, because if they have independence, that's something you're gonna, you may push the limits on, um, especially around gatherings. It's just a natural thing to do. The other piece to come, maybe to come back to, has to do with the virtual remote piece of this. Um, if there's a way, that, there are some things that actually we know work better around sustained kind of, you know, remote computer screen learning. Um, and the biggest one um, is to find a way to chunk that and to take breaks from it. Um, and that may need to be. Um, and, and this is something you all have to decide as, as, um, as the person teaching it is, is that some kids may not be able to sustain themselves for a 45 or 50 minute lesson, even high school kids. Is, so there may need to be sort of permission given to take a quick movement break in the middle of the lesson um, in the interests of keeping your brain online efficiently, keeping your frontal lobe you know, the rest of the coordinator of your cortex, keeping it um, at, a, at an alert level where you're engaged. And so as opposed to slugging it out um, for an hour and maybe having, you know, a quick break in between is to take the breaks um, more often, more strategically and with kind of a burst of movement gets the blood flowing, um, you know, your blood pressure changes, your brain activates on its own just by virtue of the, the just standing up. Um, so something quick, giving kids permission to do that. And maybe we build that in with parents um, and certainly doing it ourselves, but hard to do it when the camera's on and you're sort of expected to just be engaged. It's actually a lot easier to just sit there and kind of stare. But the longer you do that, um, to a computer screen, it does diminish your alertness and ability to learn efficiently. Um, so punctuate it with um, probably some kind of movement and some kind of planned break and give permission to uh, our kids to do that. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Barry. And I think what's been interesting is I've, I've encountered uh, districts where they're actually making the classes longer um, I'm not sure how they're doing it in Cohasset, but uh, yeah, well, that's good. I mean, We've actually made them shorter. Oh, that's great. Great. Because <laughs> we, learn, we learn better that way. We actually learn better in chunks. Yeah. I mean, it's just like dec decades of uh, like the experience I have, but there's decades of research that says that we all know you, you learn better in chunks than, um, than in this sort of sustained push, if you will. Um, but it also for educators, um, it may be an opportunity for us to be able to have them initiate it and just say, I'm actually going to stop this and we're going to go uh, all take a break on the screen, however you want to do it, turn your screen off. And in 90 seconds, we're going to come back. And then maybe you just sit in your chair and lean back. But I want all of us to go up and do X, Y, and Z. If it's teacher initiated, um, it actually makes it a lot easier and it builds it in. And so for that reason, um, but it also breaks continuity and it always doesn't feel like it's the right thing to do if you're in the middle of, uh, of an important concept. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions so far that people have or comments? No questions or comments yet, but if parents, if you have questions that you want some answers to, please type them right in and um, we have, uh, and we'll take, we'll answer those, it looks like. Okay. Actually, I see one here, Leslie. I do too, and it's I'm something having, about family dinner just popped up. On it did. I'm trying. Yeah. To, I'm having a hard time access. Oh, there. I can. Is. Would you like me to read it? I can see it. Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Please do. Family dinners have changed since COVID. Pandemic-related frustrations are transferred from students to parents. This has caused an underlying tension to be present at the dinner table, disrupting natural communication. Any advice on how to get positive conversations going again? Or is it okay to have awkward silence with teens? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I think that probably, um, yeah. yeah, those all, those of us that have raised teenagers and um, that have uh, obviously we've been one ourselves. But, um, so communication with teenagers is all about timing, and it's um, it may be hard to hear this, but um, most parents know it. It's really driven by the teenager, and so there's nothing more awkward um, than having that sort of communication be parent driven and about stuff that is something you really just don't want to talk about, period. Like how was your day? What's going on with your Chromebook? Um, what did you learn? But most parents are pretty good about going for anything that their teenager is willing to talk about. Um, I agree. I, I think that this brings a level of tension because it isn't just these kids who are working this through, it's us as adults trying to also fit it all in and perhaps doing your job from home and not having the same kind of social contacts um, that your child has as well. I mean, we're all missing that. Um, unless you're like a, the rare exception, people's social contacts have diminished considerably, both within families and within our friends. Um, and neighbors just to, over the last seven months. So um, I, I get you can have virtual parties on the internet or, you know, you can text and you, there's nothing that's the same as doing it in person. And so it adds up to create a level of fatigue. It's probably the word that comes to my mind around not being able to do things that we enjoy, just going out to dinner or having a time outside that sort of resembles what you did before. It's, it's a novelty now. So uh, dinner time might be just like, okay, let's think ahead. What is our next vacation going to be? Where do we want to go? Um, it's going to be outside of Cohasset, so dream away. You know, it could be um, going to Swampscott. No, I'm serious. <laughs> going to some place where we, we may not be able to pull it off, but let's dream it right now and use our imagination, and everybody has a say in it. So, um, but yeah. out of the box. Yeah, I would say too. I mean, uh, I, we're talking about sort of supporting kids, um, but I think, you know, parents need a lot of support too, as you're alluding to Barry, <clears throat> you know, and parents own social support networks are diminished. Um, and, you know, parents are finding themselves yelling and their level of patience is diminished. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, I think some things that parents need to kind of, allow themselves is to you know lower the parenting bar a little bit it's okay uh because everybody is strained and it's only normal and um you know when you're finding yourself yelling or feeling very frustrated uh and impatient you know um there are a host literally dozens of mindfulness sorts of exercises you can do uh one of the simplest ones is to just take a breath or two or three um, another one is to just sort of, as it says, just kind of stop, take a breath, kind of observe what's happening, what you're feeling, uh, what you're thinking, um, what is it that's happening right now, and then proceed. And sometimes just by taking a breath uh, puts you so much more in the present moment. And it kind of, kind of you shed all the baggage that gets wrapped up in why you're frustrated. Um, and that can just sort of be a calming self-soothing management technique for parents actually you know and there's lots of other ones but i would encourage them to do that because you don't have to you know a lot of people think mindfulness well i don't have time to go sit in a corner of my house and you know meditate for 15 minutes i got all this other stuff to do but you can actually do it even in the moment uh, when there's frustrating things occurring you know and of course if you do have five or ten or fifteen minutes to you know, stay focused and on the present um, <clears throat> in, in, with a whole variety of techniques. That would be a good thing for a way that for parents to actually nurture themselves and they will then have a lot more reserves left, much to their total and utter amazement, much more reserves left for dealing with their kids. And, and we have a parent who was thanking you for your um, you know, your advice and really was speaking to that, you know, how do we, how do you advise that we deescalate tensions with our elementary kids when tensions run high? Um, so sort of so, certainly taking a breath, but are there some other things that families 
Yeah. I mean, as, as um, Steve was talking, I was thinking also that uh, running households requires a lot of effort for um, all of the adults. And um, I think kind of over the last bunch of years, we've gotten away from having kids participate in that. Um, and I think this is one of those times where, I mean, you don't require it, but you really have a, a dialogue with your kids around you need their help. You just you're not making them do it. You can't make them do it, um, but you just need their help. I need you to help me with dinner. I need you to help me to clean up. I need you to vacuum. I can't do it all. And so, you know, it's not like a poor me whining conversation. It might have sounded like that, but you have a, um, but it's an appeal, especially with teenagers, but kids even who are old enough to pitch in to say, this is different. We're going to get through this, but I really could use some help. Like tonight, for example, I um, need you to cut up the potatoes. I'd like you to set the table. I'd like you to take the wash out and put it in the dryer. Um, so that it's not like, here's your chores list, here's your allowance, check it off. It's, it's an appeal and it's a participation um, because otherwise we sort of go about what we're doing and parents can feel um, just put upon um, because there isn't time for them. And so the whole notion of we have to take care of ourselves first as adults, because, you know, indulging your kids and trying to figure out, like, just making them happy, that's a never ending task. It's a bottomless pit, by the way. So, <laughs> that's not going to happen. It might sound old fashioned, but, you know, my perspective on this is that uh, a family is a community, right? And I think communities require that everybody contribute so that the community functions most optimal level for the benefit of all those in it. Um, so, you know, I don't particularly see any problem, even under normal times, uh, to have kids have chores that they're responsible for, uh, sure. because they're a part of the community, they're part of the family, and this is, they have to contribute to the family. Um, I think it instills a sense of responsibility. I think it also helps kids feel proud that they're actually contributing. It's not always easy to get them to do it, but I think the long-term benefits uh, far outweigh the short-term inconvenience and struggle to get them to do it. Um, and, uh, and it was all kinds yeah. of slicing and dicing those things, but um, it's just what you do when you're a part of something bigger than yourself. Everybody pitches in. Um, and and it, also with, with the COVID yeah. situation, of course, yeah, I think parents should feel justified in asking more of their kids. Um, and, you know, the older ones have to do a little more because they're older and it's not like everybody has to do the same thing. And, the question around tension in the household, yeah, I mean, that's, that's good. And the problem with tension is it's a fairly generic term. So at some level in the family, you've got to sort of drill down and figure out, okay, what is the root cause of this tension? You know, is it that one of them's using the better computer and the other one isn't? Or is it that, uh, you know, someone's, someone's you know, their, their earphones aren't working and so, you know, they're overhearing uh, the other kids zoom chat and it's distracting them from their own work. Um, you know, what is it that's kind of causing that tension? So you got to kind of get at, at that. And then, then I think the solutions will be at least, you know, more evident. Um, and at the same time, again, I would just come back to the idea of, it's very hard to do as a parent, of course, because you want things to kind of go the way you envision them as an adult should go. And of course, kids, don't kind of operate on the same wavelength around that um, by their very nature. So uh, I think um, I lost track where I was going with that because it obviously hit home on a very personal level. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, yeah, and dinners and things. Right. And you're, um, <laughs> It is, it's important to identify the source of it. You were talking about that, Steve, and then also figuring out, um, you know, is there a way we can address it? So it's not necessarily just processing, but problem solving. Um, so processing, problem solving. And then I'm gonna come back to something else that is um, on a more positive end of it. Novelty and surprise and, and breaking up the routine do create, um, a whole level of, you know, positive affect, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think I lost somebody on the screen. Yeah, oh, are you there? Can you see us? I uh, can now, yeah. 
But the idea that, so just change it up. Mm -hmm. Here, here's the other piece too, um, in the time we have left. Um, I, I'd like people to be aware or mindful that, um, you know, Cohasset is, is a, a community with high performing schools and um, there is literature that's been around for a little while now around kids um, not faring so well when the pressure gets too high. So I think, um, and, and I'll say this tactfully, but um, it matters um, that you get through this okay as a learner and as opposed to feeling overwhelmed by the pressures that can easily get internalized and a pandemic is a perfect storm for this because if you're planning on getting into the college of your choice and nowadays having put three kids through college after a while you realize Ooh, you know what other than maybe five or six colleges perhaps all the ivies in stanford um that there are many many choices and it's the long-term, you know, lifelong learner you're preparing for, not getting the right scores on ACT or SATs and your grade point. It's just a tremendous amount of pressure in the middle of this. And so at least being aware of it and supporting your kids, it's not permission to not do it, but it is maybe permission to take your foot off the gas. Mm -hmm. If it looks like pushing down harder will create more pressure. And, and that just doesn't work out well. So um, just being aware of it, that's all. Um, I think the tension is probably a normal, I would say, regular experience. I don't know too many, you know, other than the Brady Bunch um, back in the day where, you know, everybody just feels good and, and just pitching in. And it's those are remarkably resilient kids and families. I'm sure there are plenty of them. But most folks are saying, like, boy, this is just sometimes this isn't fun. This is hard to do. And let's put some words to it. If it's the dinner table, then that's where people gather and it's awkward. That's okay. Mm -hmm. I no, think I the parent was, oh, sorry to interrupt. The parent was following up um, with her previous question about de-escalating really around um, the remote learning, you know, and that piece when the child, you know, when child's behaviors are escalated on a remote learning day and maybe some strategies to take them back. Obviously breathing was one, um, I think. So she just clarified. Yeah, so that um, the strategies for a particular kid, and it is just remote learning, you know, sometimes go back to basics, which is um, the preparedness and the breaking it down. And a parent has the right to break it down and abbreviate a lesson. It's better to do it in half and have a best lesson occur or chunk it in two or three. And parent then drives that. They're ultimately responsible. So, um, and have a successful experience with your child. Um, incentives work really well, movement works really well, and um, lots of positive feedback. But the dread of probably getting up and acting out around getting ready to learn may be, if I'm guessing, um, one of the harder parts. Um, and so that has to kind of go back to how we might get you ready, which would be um, a reminder, a choice of what you could do first, um, beginning the lesson with the child to kind of get them warmed up. And now we don't do this with everybody, but for that kid, that might help jumpstart them to feel confident about getting it done and then fade your presence. Um, but it is, as opposed to just sort of pushing through it, it's an opportunity to problem solve that as well with um, a tightening up of routine, maybe a breaking it down into smaller chunks and creating more incentives um, for completing each chunk. When you do this, if you do all three of these and you get done what you need to do, then we'll be doing this later. We check that one off, that's good. So it creates incremental gains and marks progress and it provides praise and an incentive of what to look forward to. Yeah, I like that, right, exactly. So if the parent has the option of the availability to be monitoring it that closely, and you know, awarding the child some kind of a star or sticker it depends on the age of the kid, of course. But if there's some reminder, usually concrete and visual, that they've just earned some part of an incentive or fraction of an incentive, that could be helpful. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah not, we're not rewarding, we're not paying kids to learn or do well, but we are, we all work for incentives at some level or another, whether, and, and so it's really in the interest of getting a kid through a rougher time, both an incentive and a joining them in the routine and recognizing, yep, it's hard, let's do this next thing. The other part of it that sometimes works is not even focusing on getting up and getting ready for your lesson, but um, let's do something else instead that's entirely different. We're going to go down and make a special breakfast, and then we're going to go out in the backyard and um, kick the soccer ball around for a few minutes. And um, you know, we'll tell your teacher we're checking in a couple of minutes um, late for lesson if we get back in. We're, so you, you create a, a connection and a good space, if you will, um, and then the parents' emphasis on hmm, maybe take charge of that learning time and do what you need to to shape it. Now, that having been said, we don't want a kid missing large parts of a lesson or feeling out of out of sync either. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea, Barry. The uh, the idea of actually engaging in some kind of uh, meaningful activity that has connection and I think also, as you've been bringing out many times, having some kind of movement in it, because we know that movement is actually very good for preparing the brain to actually do work, paradoxically. And I would just say also the escalation, you know, more than likely, I mean, it could be lots of things, but most of the time it's because there's some kind of anxiety underneath. Um, there's something the kid is uncomfortable with, fearful of, afraid they're not going to do well. Um, and of course, you know, depending on the age of the kid, you may not be able to figure it out but if you just keep an ear open to what it is and maybe observe what they're trying to do um, there's probably some aspect of the remote learning uh, method that they feel somehow more challenged by and therefore want to avoid and therefore escalate the, the behavior before they have to engage in it so i mean it could be lots of different things but uh, yeah steve you hit on that learning piece i think that's a that's a good point that I've heard it often enough where parents will hear the child say, mommy, it's hard to learn this way. I can't learn this way the same way. It's confusing. The pace is too quick um, because of the modality. I mean, you just think about it as good as your teachers are. It's still um, enough for restriction and modality. So it may be a learning issue. And if that's the case, um, if you're having a conversation with your child around that, and that is the source, Dr. Bernardo just said, no, this stuff has underlying causes. We sometimes get to that. Pass it on to the child's teacher and see if there's some modifications that can be made as a result of that. Um, maybe you do more coaching. Maybe the teacher spends a little extra time if it's possible. So there's a, it's an opportunity to have a dialogue as opposed to just seeing the behavior as you know, purely anxiety, purely resistance. Well, I'm watching the time. It's seven o'clock. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, but any final last words, Dr. Plummer or Dr. Bonato? Was given us a lot to think about. <laughs> so we're going to keep. So this is a work in progress. Um, there, so there are two things. Um, one is keep an eye on how your kids are doing. Um, they may not adjust to this as well. Some kids, obviously, if they're going to adjust to it, they would have by now. If there are modifications, I call them like mid-course corrections, contact your teacher about that. Contact your child's teacher with, you know, not a huge problem, but early enough to say, here's what I'm hearing and seeing from my child. Um, any thoughts, just pass it on. And then the second is, um, there just is more anxiety and dysphoria from a whole lot of folks doing this. And so um, paying attention to that, and finding a way both to address it. it doesn't have to be everybody goes into psychotherapy, but it does mean that you acknowledge it. And activation in terms of activity is a, a legitimate corollary treatment for anxiety and depression. You know, Steve said this a little earlier, activation meaning activities and doing something else, not just talking about your feelings, is a, is a, a nice addition. So figure out how to add that in every day or a few times a week to what we're doing now in our routines, as stressed as everybody is. So. But uh, I would, my final thoughts too would be just to that, you know, as adults and parents, you know, we have a certain idea about how things should go. 
in the service of our children's, you know, optimal development. And I think um, because oftentimes things don't go as we think they should, we then focus on all that didn't happen that was supposed to. And I think it's important as a parent and adult to actually step back and say, okay, well, what was it that actually did go well? Because no doubt many things did go well. It just didn't meet your high expectations. So you lower your expectations and you make yourself notice what things have gone well. And then, you know, slather on the, uh, the acknowledgement and the praise to your kid for what they have done, you know, because it's tough on them too. Anyway. The juniors and seniors in particular, as the year goes on, um, having a conversation or dialogue regularly around how they're doing without having it be so focused on um, maybe not meeting their expectations. Because if that, that's that other dialogue that it, it prepares them, if they are meeting them, great. If they're not, um, it's okay, they'll get through this. It, the reality is, is that they will. And in the long run, um, it, it will be okay. And parents, need, we need to reassure our kids of that because then it, as a teenager, that stuff gets internalized. You don't always put those words to it in your conversation with your mom or dad. You might have to read the tea leaves and introduce or just reassure without asking to talk about it. It'll be okay. We'll figure this out. Um, good. So well, good luck everybody and vote. Everybody vote. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. Um, well, Dr. Palmer, Dr. Bonato, thank you so much. Mrs. Sawanka, did you have anything you wanted to close us out with? Or just so glad that you could be here with us again tonight and kind of, you know, check in with us as we're a month into this and see how we're all doing. And um, you know what? We're all in this together. We're going to get through this. That's right. Yep. So and I thank the, the parents who did uh, participate and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye. All right. Good Thanks night. for thanks for having us. Bye bye. Bye.